Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. We welcome those of you who are here in Antiquarian Hall where we have a packed house in the reading room as well as those who are joining us on YouTube. We are on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper and I have the honor of serving as president of the American Antiquarian Society. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce the 18th Robert C. Barron Lecture. The Barron Lecture honors Bob Barron, the founder and president of Fulcrum Publishing. Bob is a historian, a scientist, and the author, or con author of or contributor to 25 books, including Pioneers and Plotters, The American Entrepreneurial Spirit. Bob was program manager for the Mariner 2 Venus and Mariner 4 Mars onboard space computers. In 1971, he founded Prime Computer, which became one of the Fortune, 5, Fortune 500 largest American companies, and he was its first president and chief executive officer, building a worldwide business. Bob Barron led the American Antiquarian Society as chairman of our council from 1993 to 2003, and he is watching tonight on YouTube from his home in Denver. The Barron Lecture brings a distinguished American Antiquarian Society member who has written a seminal work of history here to Antiquarian Hall to reflect on the book's impact on scholarship and society in the years since its first appearance. Previous Barron lecturers have included Bernard Balin, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, John Demos, Mary Beth Norton, James H. Merrill, and last year, Jacqueline Jones. Our 2023 Barron lecturer was a Peterson Fellow here in 1991-1992 in when she was working on the groundbreaking book we celebrate tonight. Nell Irvin Painter was then professor, and she's now Professor Emerita of History at Princeton University. And the book is Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, published in 1996. When this book came out, the historian Ira Berlin wrote in the New York Times that, in his words, Sojourner Truth strides through American history larger than life. The great strength of Ms. Painter's biography he continued, is its understanding of how Isabella, that's Sojourner Truth's birth name, slowly, if incompletely, sloughed off the weight of slavery, mastered herself, and employed the camouflage of race, native wit rather than book learning, quaint dialect rather than fine elocution, ramrod posture rather than feminine demeanor, severe dress rather than fa fashionable attire to make herself a symbol of black womanhood of a certain sort. In a review in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Emma Lapsansky enthused, Nell Painter has done it again. We painter fans who enjoyed the crisp, unromanticized, no-nonsense prose with which painter brought us biographies of Hosea Hudson and the Exodusters will be happy with what painter has done with truth. This cleverly constructed biography, Lapsansky explained, is actually a collection of 26 contemplative essays and a coda about us Americans and our expectations of history. Anne Rose, writing in the Journal of Southern History, wrote that the achievement of the book lies in Painter's determination to separate fact from fiction without denying the historical importance of myth. These are just a few of the stellar reviews this book received when it came out in 1996. Nell Irvin Painter has received no fewer than eight honorary doctorates. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2018, she received the American Historical Association's Award for Scholarly, Scholarly Distinction. Those are just a few of her many awards and honors. Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, was Painter's fourth book. And since Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, she has written and had published four more, including Southern History Across the Color Line, Creating Black Americans, African American History and Its Meanings, The History of White People, and most recently, her memoir, Old in Art School, A Memoir of Starting Over. 
And indeed, that is what Dr. Painter has done since retiring from Princeton. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Rutgers University in 2009, followed by a Master of Fine Arts in Painting from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2011. She's had solo shows at the Brooklyn Historical Society, at Harvard, and at Time and Space Unlimited, among other galleries. She's participated in many group exhibitions and has placed her work in public collections ranging from the National Museum of African American History and Culture to the Smith, Museum, Smith College Museum of Art. On her website, Nell Painter writes that using found images and digital manipulation, I reconfigure the past and revision myself through self-portraits. After a life of historical truth and political engagement with American society, my artwork represents freedom, including the freedom to be totally self-centered. <laughs> Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Nell Painter back to the American Antiquarian Society to talk about her groundbreaking book and how she continues to think about Sojourner Truth 27 years after its publication. She has titled tonight's lecture, Sojourner Truth Was a New Yorker, and she didn't say that. It's a pleasure to turn the podium over to Nell Painter to deliver the Robert C. Barron lecture. Thank you so much, Scott, and thank you, all of you, all of you, for being here. It's, um, it's always a pleasure to be here at the American Antiquarian Society, under its luminous dome, beside its broad, oh, they're gone now, its broad gauge uh, tables, <laughs> amid intense uh, researchers engrossed in primary sources decipherable only to them. I was one of you in the early 1990s, as you said, doing research that underpinned my book, Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, which W.W. W. Norton published in 1996, and that won the nonfiction prize from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. I should add, though, th that that book was, was not uh, universally adored the then uh, Women's Review um, of Books didn't review it because two reviewers said, we've got trouble with this book. I thought that's what reviews were for. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one um, of my male historian <clears throat> colleagues in I think the New Republic just chopped it to pieces, and me too. Um, so all was not hunky-dory. So um, when I was here, I was elbow deep in the entrails of works like the Salem, Ohio Anti-Slavery Bugle, where I found a contemporaneous report of Truce 1851 remarks in Akron, Ohio, and also the Millerite newspaper, The Midnight Cry, with its earnest chronicles of its version of history and its imaginative visual representations. I never learned who created uh, the Millerite graphics, but the newspaper reminded me of the power of print, the very life's blood coursing through the mind and body of the American Antiquarian Society. My gratitude to this most welcoming institution runs deep, and I want to thank you, especially this year, Scott Casper and Nan Moverton. More recently, a Zoom lecture by M. Jeffrey M. McCullough, author of Publishing Plates, Stereotyping and Electrotyping in 19th Century U.S. Print Culture, helped me to move Sojourner Truth more firmly into the history of the book, or in more recent parlance, into print and material culture. Once again, I'm indebted to the AAS, and I thank you. The title of this lecture quotes the title of the book I'm working on right now, Sojourner Truth Was a New Yorker, and She Didn't Say That, Essays on Sojourner Truth that lean more towards materials than identity. 
um, I'm not engaging in identity-related surmise. I'm talking about material things. Here, her self-published book, Narrative of Sojourner Truth, first published in 1850, rather than casting her as a representative black American. As a historian, I've always been more interested in the specifics of individual experience than in generalizing on the basis of social identity. Even though, even despite the so very many unanswered questions in Sojourner Truth's life that have invited others into rampant generalization. In Sojourner Truth was a New Yorker, the specificity in question is geographic, referring to the first half of Truth's life spent in Ulster County in the Hudson Valley of New York. Where is Ulster County in the Hudson Valley of New York? Do you know? How many of you know? Uh, you're the smart ones. <laughs> <laughs> From New York City, staying on the right bank of the Hudson River, take I-87, the New York Thruway, north towards Albany. Then take exit 18 to New Paltz, or exit 19 to Kingston. You would have to continue north to exits 23 and 24 to reach Albany on the right bank and Troy on the left bank, or take uh, I-90 west towards Syracuse, Rochester, and eventually going a little to the north to Battle Creek, Michigan. That's all to the west of the Hudson River. But if you take I-90 east, you'd be on the Massachusetts Turnpike, the Mass Pike, towards Boston, passing exit 41 towards Northampton, exit 45 towards Springfield, exit 90 toward Worcester, or maybe it was, is still exit 10? I'm not sure about the Worcester exit. Uh, and exit 133 to downtown Boston, all Sojourner Truth's um, territory as a self published author. In her more than 40 New York years, so that is almost half her life, Sojourner Truth had three names. She was known as Isabella in the 30 years of her Ulster County enslavement, and then as Isabella von Wagenen, a self-emancipated young woman who walked out of bondage with a baby on her hip or in her arms, or on her back. Isabella in Ulster County had already become a dynamic preacher, a fetching singer, a gifted dancer. In New York City, she joined the Kingdom of Matthias, a religious commune her friends saw as a cult and tried, in vain, to talk her out of. In 1835, in New York City, Isabella von Wagenen first appeared in print as a person of authority in Gilbert Vale's Fanaticism, Its Source and Influence, illustrated by the simple narrative of Isabella in the case of Matthias, Mr. and Mrs. B. Volger, Mr. Pearson, Mr. Mills, Catherine, Isabella, et cetera, et cetera. That's all the title. Vail um, entitled the main portion of his book, Narrative of Isabella. Even her first steps as Sojourner Truth in 1843 took her from Lower Manhattan to Brooklyn and across Long Island, still firmly in New York State. The conjunction and in my new book's title takes newly renamed Sojourner Truth from New York State to Northampton, Massachusetts, to the secular commune where she reinvented herself as a feminist abolitionist and found like-minded uh, Olive Gilbert to whom Truth dictated narrative of Sojourner Truth, the multi-editioned, as told to autobiography that made her a successful self-published author, my topic this evening. 
that narrative of Soderna truth went through multiple editions is of itself a testimonial to its longstanding appeal. The second clause of my book's title, She Didn't Say That, draws attention away from Harriet Beecher Stowe's and Francis Dana Gage's dramatic and imaginatively stereotypical renderings of truth. I look toward the ways that Sojourner Truth represented herself across genres, in her words spoken aloud, in narrative of Sojourner Truth, and in the photographic carte de visite portraits that she had made of herself in the 1860s. In my book, but not here, I spend time with two other self-published authors, Harriet Jacobs and Frances Watkins Harper, both abolitionists, though the one born enslaved in North Carolina and the other born free in Baltimore. I look closely at the objects in Sojourner Truth's carte de visite, the props she holds, such as her knitting, her grandson's photograph, and the clothes she chose to wear, all belonging to the material self-fashioning of Sojourner Truth. My book will pause over truth knitting, an art often and mistakenly associated only with white women. Today, thanks to social media, black women knitters, myself included, can be seen disproving this stereotype by knitting in public. <laughs> and by opening yarn shops like Beyond Yarn in Union, New Jersey. Much in truth's life lacks answers, sometimes lacking even informed questions because she did not write herself and because of prevailing racist, sexist habits of erasure of black women that still persist. In those places of lack, in those instances, I do not guess about truth's motives. I do not substitute other black women's experiences or behaviors or words to fill in truth's silences. The extraordinary Sojourner Truth, a truly unique figure in life as in American history, cannot be explained through recourse to generalizations about black people as a whole. All is not lost, however, for staying focused on the actual Sojourner Truth repays the attention. I pry truth away from Francis Dana Gage's famous slogan, which truth did not say, with its temptations to ignore the fullness of her life by flattening truth and rooting her in the metaphorical land of blackness and slavery, the slaveholding South. I do not diminish truth's historical importance as I peer closely at truth did with what she owned. I just want you to see more. Sojourner Truth's unique spent, uh, excuse me, Sojourner Truth's unique strengths as a public speaker, her intelligence molded through wit, her preacher's persuasive grasp of the Bible in calls for moral than political activism and her indelible imprint on public life have overshadowed her self-expression in objects. I want to talk about something beyond her dynamism as a public speaker. I want to highlight her skills, her successes, her steadfastness as a self-published author of an as-told-to autobiography bringing her into view as an author who published her own public image does at least two important things. First, Sojourner Truth author reveals the financial worth of authorship in her life. As Jeffrey McCullough says, the stereotype plates to her narrative remained Truth's major piece of literary property 
a material text that allowed her autonomy and income. Buying on credit and paying off her debts, Truth was able to own her books, publish, um, sorry, able to own her books, purchase a two-story house at 35 Park Street and a lot in Northampton. She sold that house and she bought others in Harmonia and then in Battle Creek, Michigan. Her daughters and grandsons, often living with her, were most likely financially dependent upon her. Her book and later her photographs supported what she called her substance, and I'm assuming the substance of her multi-generational family. Second, situating truth within the history of the book alters our view of mid-19th century America and the importance of its popular literary culture for all Americans, including black Americans. Pausing over Sojourner Truth's presence in print culture adds an additional dimension to her as an icon in American history. We can see her, yes, of course, as an embodiment of feminist and anti-slavery verbal power. I mean to add even more weight, to make even more consequential her place in American history. I want women writers, especially black women writers, to identify with Sojourner Truth as an author because her example offers, through self-publication and distribution, a model of intentional self-expression. Sojourner Truth author opens up the cultural geography of American blackness by emphasizing the terrain where black authors published and sold their own books, the non-Southern states of the Northeast. Truth takes us beyond the South, beyond the emblematic site of 19th century American blackness. Truth's non-Southern, mid-19th century terrain is a place where reading is valued, in newspapers, yes, and in books. This non-Southern society features regular visits from black and other authors marketing and distributing their own works by themselves, one meeting, especially one anti-slavery meeting, to the next, where these authors were familiar figures. This black and non-black North, often racially mixed, was accustomed to the presence of authors carrying their books around to sell one book at a time. Frederick Douglass, the quintessence of such authors, sold his own narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, 1845, one book by one book from anti-slavery meeting to anti-slavery meeting to a total of some 29,000 copies, an American bestseller. When I stress the role of antebellum authors as their own distributors, I'm speaking of a time before the developed networks of wholesale and retail book distribution familiar today. But even had elaborate distribution networks existed, they would likely have remained beyond the reach of most self-published authors which still can be the case today. Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave, narrative of Solomon Northup, a citizen of New York, kidnapped in Washington City in 1841, rescued in 1853 from a cotton plantation near the Red River in Louisiana, was the exceedingly rare black book published by a commercial publisher, Derby and Miller in 1853, the year of the second edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth, originally published in 1850. Solomon Northup, like Sojourner Truth, was a proud New Yorker, born in about 1807 in Minerva, New York, 
exit 26 off the Adirondack Northway in what is now the Adirondack Park, where I spend a good deal of my time. Whenever I pass exit 26, I think of Solomon Northup. When he was abducted from a job in Washington, D.C., Northup was working in the resort town of Saratoga Springs, New York, just north of Albany at exit, exit 15, off the Northway. Uh, Northup, like truth, reminds us that black Americans lived and worked in northern territories so often assumed to be lily white, a reminder that is still needed. Sojourner Truth's life as an author began when she left New York City in 1843, settled into a decade and a half's residence in Northampton, Massachusetts, and collaborated with her amanuensis, Olive Gilbert, on narrative of Sojourner Truth. Gilbert and Truth were both living in the Northampton residence of George Benson's family in the aftermath of the collapse of the Northampton Association for Education and Industry, a secular liberal commune where Truth had settled in either late 1843 or early 1844 and stayed on after the commune's bankruptcy and dissolution in 1846. George Benson was William Lloyd Garrison's brother-in-law with long-standing abolitionist and anti-racist bona fides dating back to his pre-Northampton days in Connecticut in defense of Prudence Crandall. The Progressive Northampton Association shifted truth who on her arrival in Northampton had moved in circles of enthusiastic religion into anti-slavery and feminist activism. In the late 1840s, Truth and Gilbert undertook their project at a time in publishing history when works by people who had been enslaved were becoming familiar. The American Antiquarian Society hosts a collaborative research project on black self-publishing that already contains a list of 575 books, broadsides, pamphlets by more than 250 authors, likely self-published by people of African descent who resided in North America and either were born before 1851 or first published before 1846. And here's where I do need a link. HTTPS colon slash slash www.americanantiquarian.org slash black self-publishing. Okay, you got that. <laughs> Truth's narrative joined an already recognizable body of works. The earliest ex-slave narratives had been published in the late 18th century in England and New England by authors who had been born in Africa, Yukasa Groni Osa, Ulida Equiano, and Venture Smith. Life of William Grimes, the Runaway Slave, written by himself, 1825, is recognized as the first American ex-slave narrative but it appeared before the abolitionist movement had developed a network capable of fostering a thriving book market. Grimes' narrative was republished in 1855, a far more propitious time. Another early narrative discouraged the publication of personal narratives by anti-slavery organizations. James Williams' 1838 narrative of James Williams, an American slave who was for several years a driver on a cotton plantation in Alabama, published by the American Anti-Slavery Society. James Williams's narrative became mired in controversy after the American Anti-Slavery Society's editorial role, a book publishing strategy 
not to be repeated as the genre flourished. Two best-selling narratives, Douglas's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass and William Wells Brown's narrative of William Wells Brown, The Fugitive Slave from 1847, demonstrated the promise and costs of black books. Both authors self-published, bearing the cost of stereotyping, printing, and binding their first editions. In Brown's case, the amount was about $300. As truth would in the 1850s, both Douglas and Brown sold their books through author tours, in their cases curtailed in the U.S. by the need to flee the U.S. shortly after publication under threat of re-enslavement. People in Britain and Ireland bought their books with enthusiasm expressed substantively. Despite their forced exile, Douglas and Brown offered truth examples of authorial success. Even though as a woman, as a black woman, her visibility did not approach theirs. While Truth had already begun speaking at women's rights and anti-slavery meetings in the 1840s, her narrative would not appear as the thrilling exploits of an already highly visible character. Her motive for publication was material. The last pages of Truth's narrative speak not of Southern trauma and its transcendence, but of poor old Truth's financial need. Truth had set her heart upon having a little home of her own where she can repose a little after her day of action has passed by. She is now dependent on the charities of the benevolent and to them we appeal with confidence. So this is, this is the end of narrative of Sojourner Truth. So you think, oh, this poor old woman. And as I will tell you in a moment, this poor old woman, once she published her book, she's going all around selling them herself. <laughs> uh, the house in question was on Park Street in Florence, a neighborhood in Northampton, not far from the erstwhile Northampton Association. Truth bought on credit, taking out a mortgage of $300 that she was able to pay off in November 1854, thanks to sales through her intensive and extensive book tours that brought her money as well as fame. Decades later, Truth's celebrity amazed Gilbert, who admitted, I did not think you were laying the foundations of such an almost worldwide reputation when I wrote that little book for you. <laughs> On its first printing in 1850, Narrative of Sojourner Truth embodied not so much charity as exchange. The exchange began with one American's life story and ended in a house. Connecting the two ends was debt. When Sojourner Truth sought to publish her autobiography, she had little or no money, as her work, like the work of others in the Northampton Association, had been unpaid. But Truth's Northampton community repaid her in another crucial way. I guess I could say through networking. Uh, through its support of the American Anti-Slavery Society and its journal, The Liberator, whose printer, James N. Yarrington, made the stereotype plates of narrative of Sojourner Truth on credit and printed its first edition in 1850. By 1850, stereotype plates had become common in the U.S., even though stereotyping was initially more expensive than typesetting individual letters of standing type by skilled typesetters. Stereotype was made from hot metal into plates that could be used repeatedly to make identical reprints, each stereo holding multiple pages, eight or 16, depending on the size of the book, 
I estimate the truce little 128 page, seven and three quarter inch by five inch paper bound narrative, which she sold for 25 cents, would have required about 12 stereos. Even though stereos were lighter than forms full of type, they were too heavy to carry around on a daily basis. Truth's friends not only lent her the cost of making stereotype, they also bought them from her and stored them safely for her use later on. The marketing of Sojourner, narrative of Sojourner Truth began pre-publication with puff pieces by William Lloyd Garrison in The Liberator in April and May, 1850. Garrison called Truth's book a most interesting narrative of a most remarkable and highly meritorious woman, the sale of which is to be for her exclusive benefit. We commend it to all the friends of the colored population. Truth launched her book at a Boston meeting of the New England Anti-Slavery Convention in June, that is June of 1815. Garrison introduced Truth to the meeting where she spoke for about half an hour. She then set out on a book tour through New England, starting in Eastern Massachusetts, and including the Abington, Massachusetts 4th of July celebration and the Worcester, Massachusetts 1st of August celebration of West Indian emancipation, the same Western Massachusetts Worcester, home of the American Antiquarian Society since 1812. Abington lies south of Boston, off exit 38B from Route 3, which is the Pilgrim's Highway. In September 1850, Truth was still on the road, speaking and selling, when the Fugitive Slave Act was signed into law, galvanizing the anti-slavery community and prodding Americans who hadn't been paying attention. Truth's author tour extended past the summer's end and its good weather. In October, she spoke at the National Women's Convention in Worcester, in Rhode Island in November, in Plymouth, Massachusetts in December, and in coastal Dover, New Hampshire, Fall River, Massachusetts, and Winsocket and Valley Falls, Rhode Island, in the eastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island shipping region that had welcomed Frederick and Anna Douglas in 1838. All along, Truth books sold briskly as she proudly reported to friends. In Sojourner Truth's America, the historian Margaret Washington meticulously traces Truth's itinerary, and I'm drawing on her work here. Truth's early 1851 book tour began with an invitation from Garrison and was intended as a threesome with the British Member of Parliament, George Thompson. When Garrison fell ill, Truth and Thompson set out together in a collaboration that Truth described as respectful and friendly. They started in Little Falls, New York, on the Mohawk River on Route 5, exit 29A off I-90 on the way to Utica from Albany. On her own later on, Truth toured by horse and buggy. She was dressed sensibly for travel and she was carrying a basket or a carpet bag full of her books for sale in meetings in West Winfield, Troy, the Hudson Valley, Syracuse, and the Finger Lakes of Western New York. In February 1851, Truth was in Union Village, New York, which is now Greenwich Village, in Washington County's Route 29, where her audience pressed around her to purchase her books and to hear her sing. This upstate New York leg of her 1851 tour introduced Truth to Amy and Isaac Post, anti-slavery Quakers and spiritualists in Rochester 
who hosted her that winter and remained Truth's dear friends. The Post had earlier hosted Harriet Jacobs for an extended visit, and Amy Post had urged Jacobs to write her own book. By spring of 1851, Truth was in Ohio's Western Reserve, in Cleveland on Lake Erie, and in Akron, now just off I-76, south of Cleveland, at a women's rights convention chaired by Frances Dana Gage and attempted by the snippy, bigoted journalist Jane Swissom, who recalled a large black woman in Akron selling books. Sell her books, Truth did, as well as joining the proceedings and comments that 12 years later, Gage wrote up and invented the refrain, aren't I a woman? Truth's book tour was exceedingly far ranging for a mature black woman traveling alone, taking her across New England, upstate New York, eastern Ohio, and into northern Pennsylvania. By the time she had spent three months in Ohio in 1851, she had exhausted her supply of books on hand. She asked Garrison to send her 600 more books and a copy of her printer's bill. She paid both Garrison and Yarrington, urging Garrison to ship her books promptly, for she said, I may get out of books before they arrive. Truth's book tour continued with her speaking and selling throughout 1851, 1852, and 1853, making her a standout on the women's rights and anti-slavery circuit. At a women's rights convention in New York City in September 1853, Truth declared her identity. I am also a citizen of the state of New York, for I was born in it, therefore I feel right at home here. Still in New York City in September 1853, she spoke at the whole world temperance meeting, sounding a note she would rework a decade later as the caption of her carte de visite photographic portraits. She said, I've got a narrative of one part of my life, and I take that part to support the other. By 1853, a new addition was needed to supply Truth's continual speaking cum book tour, as the first 1850 edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth sold out in three years, thanks to Truth's indefatigable marketing and sales. Even though she owned the plates, the new edition would be printed at her expense. How to find the money to pay for it? An old friend from New York City, James Boyle, financed this new edition by purchasing the stereos from Truth and holding on to them for her until she could afford to recover them in the 1870s. I don't know when in 1853 she received the new edition, nor do I know when in 1853 she went to Andover, Massachusetts to request every author's most sought after promotional tool, a blurb from, <clears throat> a, blurb from a famous person. In 1853, Truth left Andover with a blurb from Harriet Beecher Stowe, America's best-selling author. Stowe saved her recollection of truth for publication 10 years later, amid the Civil War's clamor for Negro material. In April 1863, Stowe published Sojourner Truth, the Libyan Sybil in the nation's most respected magazine, the Atlantic Monthly. This widely read and beloved piece of mid-19th century mainstream journalism was vintage Stowe, but it lost favor in the 20th century. 
Truth biographer Margaret Washington aptly calls Stowe's word portrait, Sojourner Truth in Blackface. Immediately after publication of Stowe's Sojourner Truth, the Libyan Civil, this is 1863 now, Francis Dana Gage imported Stowe's dramatic plotting into a Sojourner Truth essay of her own, entitled simply Sojourner Truth, and published in the Anti-Slavery Standard. In her word portrait, Gage has Truth repeating the aren't I a woman refrain four times, a repeated utterance that appears nowhere in the contemporary report taken down by the designated reporter at Akron in 1851. At some point in the 20th century, Gage's aren't was reworked into ain't, presumably to sound more authentically Negro and more Southern, even though truth was not from the South, and Northern antebellum country people used both versions of the negative. The drama and the convenience of Gage's formula has come to sum up Sojourner Truth all by itself, flattening out a woman of many skills and prompting an assumption that Truth, once enslaved, must have been a Southerner. Despite their flights of imagination and their evocation of common stereotypes, Stowe's and, and Gage's essays increased Sojourner Truth's visibility beyond audiences she could speak to and market to personally. In the summer of 1863, the anti-slavery journalist James Redpath republished both Stowe's and Gage's articles on truth in his Boston Commonwealth newspaper and sought truth's opinion of these versions of her life. With characteristic diplomacy, Truth called Stowe's essay not quite correct. She must have misunderstood me. If they really wanted to know her, Truth advised her public to read her own narrative, offering to send Red Path six copies at 25 cents each. She added that she could also send copies of her photograph also for sale. During the Civil War, Truth had taken an additional step into self-fashioning by having photographic portraits, carte de visite, taken, which she captioned with the revision of her 1850 formula, linking her self-portrait to her livelihood. The earlier narrative of one part of my life, and I take that part to support the other, she tightened into, I sell the shadow to support the substance, to caption all her photographs. Well, all her photographs except for one. Only in 1876, in a photo in the fourth edition of Narrative, which was intended for sale in the U.S. Centennial in Philadelphia, only then did Truth substitute the Libyan Sybil, which is uh, Stowe's formulation, for her own earlier, I sell the shadow to support the substance. Nearly 80 in 1876, and ultimately too ill to travel to Philadelphia, Truth let Stowe's famous sobriquet replace her own longtime caption. Let me add that at no point did Truth repeat Gage's formulation of her remarks in 1851 or acknowledge them as an accurate characterization. Gage's words as captions of photographs of Sojourner Truth are an invention of 20th century feminism. The last edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth came out posthumously in 1883, encapsulating a local struggle over the possession of Truth's memory between, on the one hand, her Battle Creek, Michigan companion, Francis Titus, 
a Quaker cousin of Truth's Rochester friend, Isaac Post, and so a former abolitionist. And on the other hand, the descendants of Millerites in Battle Creek who had become Seventh-day Adventist and with whom Truth had become friendly. After a brief tussle with Adventists favoring their own dime tabernacle as the venue of Truth's funeral, Battle Creek's leading citizens brought her commemoration to the Congregational Presbyterian Church. Although the Adventist Review and Herald publishing house in Battle Creek printed the last editions of Narrative of Sojourner Truth, Boston is listed as the place of publication, presumably to distance the memory of truth from Adventists and to anchor her in the New England home of abolition. When Truth died, she was one of Battle Creek's most famous inhabitants, fame she shared with the Adventist Ellen White and Battle Creek Sanatorium's John Harvey Kellogg. To conclude, let me say that our current, in our current century, Sojourner Truth has gained wide visibility and deep appreciation. She is rightly valued as a tribune of inclusion who makes black women and all women seen and heard, the very embodiment of intersectionality. She is necessary in our vision of American history. Tall, strong, dark-skinned, she fills our need for a st an historical figure who, in today's parlance, looks like us. At the same time, she is familiar for a phrase she didn't say, a phrase whose very convenience invites us to stop right there. To stop right there with the slogan blots out a dimension of truth that not only can inspire writers today, but also reveals a more capacious antebellum blackness. With the image of Sojourner Truth, the self-published author of an as-told-to autobiography in mind, a woman paying for her houses, supporting her family, and traveling widely as a political activist, we can also enlarge the terrain of 19th century blackness to encompass the northern communities where the works of black authors were bought and sold. Communities of readers of black books, newspapers, and pamphlets, the southern home of the majority of antebellum black Americans, tragically blighted the intellects of the people but that was not all there was to African America. Particularly in New England and New York State, black authors were publishing their works against the odds, nourishing a hunger for the printed word. Mid 19th century Northern states uh, were reading states where black authors were not a strange sight where I imagine that every month's church service, women's rights meeting, African-American convention, and anti-slavery meeting would host at least one traveling author selling their books. Sojourner Truth, self-published author of an as-told-to autobiography, can alert you to a world of readers, black and white, of the works of black authors. Sojourner Truth was more successful than many another self-published author. I urge you not only to recognize her uh, as an eloquent activist, embodying and speaking truth to power, yes, but don't stop there. Add another layer to her historical contribution, a layer that few authors have reached then and now, making a living as an author. Also as an author among an entire cohort of self-published authors. 
the feminist and anti-slavery networks that bought her books represented a minority of Northerners, yes. But that network existed and bought narrative of Sojourner Truth and the printed and bound stories of hundreds of other black authors. These books belong not only to the history of American literature, these books belong to the American history of book and print culture. Beyond her place in history, Sojourner Truth also serves as the patron saint of women writers, of black women writers, of self-published writers taking their books to the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that marvelous talk, which puts truth in another light. And we have time for questions. I have a mic here if folks would like to ask questions. My colleague Nan Wolverton is in the back taking questions from our YouTube audience as well. So if you're in the audience here and you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Start with our President Emerita, yes. Ellen Dunlap. Great talk, Nao. I want to ask you about your own intentions and um, inspirations. When you put the pen down on the first book, did you know you had this much more to say? Or were there things that spurred you? And what were those things? Thank you, Ellen. And it's good to see you again. Um, uh, I, well, in the 90s, I thought I had done it. But in the 21st century, Sojourner Truth has become so much better known. And, uh, you know, you just Google Sojourner Truth and you get, aren't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? Aren't, you know. And it's just that. And the assumption of Southerness. Now, I am not a proud New Yorker. I am a proud New Jerseyan. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I, I feel oppressed by the South and all the awful things it has done to its people, especially its black people. And I am not an Afro-pessimist. Um, I think we need to know more about what was possible in our country. I mean, we know a lot about what was impossible in our country. We know a lot about the Ku Klux Klan. We know a lot about slaveholders. We know a lot about the bad stuff. We know less than we should. I think about the saving remnant. I'm talking about people who were in the minority of Northerners, of New Yorkers, but they were there. And Sojourner Truth is the example of the material example of someone who lived in that world and published in that world and sold her books in that world and publicized her books in that world and bought her three houses. Thank you for making our Thank you. Nan? Nan? Uh, yes, we have a question here from Dee uh, asking if there are any of the original of Truth's books that are still extant. Yes, they are. There are originals and they're right here at the American Antiquarian Society. <laughs> That was the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah. However, there's no more of her knitting or her sewing, unfortunately. More questions. Nan, do you have... Oh, here we go. Right here. I was wondering about uh, public libraries. Did her books get into public libraries? Yes. Uh, her books are in public libraries. There are many versions of Narrative of Sojourner Truth. The one that is in most public libraries, or the larger, largest number of public libraries, is my own Penguin Classic. But there are several um, current uh, editions of Narrative of Sojourner Truth. And I highly recommend to you Margaret Washington's 
uh, Sojourner Truths America, which is a tour de force of, of historical scholarship. We know that CDV image so well. I wonder if there's any, what did she look like as a young woman? Remember a few years ago, we had that Harriet Tubman young image come up yeah. and we were just shocked. So I just wonder about that. No, there's, <clears throat> there was, there's a, an engraving in uh, the first edition of Narrative of Sojourner Truth that purports to be of her as a young woman, but it is a work of imagination. Yes, I have several questions here, but I wanna start uh, with this one from Caroline, who's just as a follow-up to the previous question, are there surviving autographed copies? Um, surviving autographed copies? Well, Sojourner Truth didn't write, and I don't, uh, that one example of her writing is not on a copy of her narrative, is it? No, no. I'm talking to Lisa Baskin, who's a super duper expert. <laughs> Nan, do you want to? Yes, and then Sandra is asking if you would like to say anything, uh, make reference to the saga of Truth's son, Peter Bomfrey. Well, um, I can, yes, I will in Sojourner Truth was a New Yorker. Um, very, very briefly, uh, Sojourner Truth's young son, Peter, at the age of about seven or eight, was illegally sold into perpetual bondage in Alabama, which was against the law in New York State. And I mentioned that uh, Harriet Jacobs is a counterpoint She's a counterpoint not only as an author, but also as an enslaved woman who was facing the trafficking of her child or her children in her case. And um, Jacobs was in North Carolina, which lacked the laws to protect, uh, well, I mean, in North Carolina, as in the slave states, it, there were no laws to protect against trafficking. There were laws to protect trafficking. Uh, trafficking children was perfectly legal in the southern states until the 13th Amendment. And one of the crimes on our American history is the trafficking of children. It's the trafficking of people and the breaking up of families, but in particular, the traffic of, trafficking of children. Oh, but um, she did get her son back. And that became news, interestingly enough. So um, Carlton may be published about the same time I did uh, in the 90s. Margaret Washington's um, v deeply researched um, book came out early in the 21st century. Um, and we all talked about the trafficking of Peter. So it wasn't a secret. But a few years ago, an archivist in New York State found the actual papers in the archives. And it became a huge news story. This is the difference between the United States uh, understanding of American history in the 90s and our understanding of American history in our own time. So Sojourner Truth has changed since the 90s because she is so much better known. And also, I think, because people like you are willing to understand Sojourner Truth as more than a slogan. I'll bet you were perfectly happy to, to see Sojourner Truth as an author. Are there other questions? Oh, Nan, you have another one, and then we'll go, and we'll go to the side of the room. Uh, Layla is asking, what hopes do you have for young people to connect to these important texts? I'm sorry, I, uh, my children are adults, uh, my grandchildren live far away from me. The book that I have given um, my uh, youngest grandchild is um, Amanda Gorman's book and a book by Lisa Ransom, 
Um, but I am not in the world of children's books. I apologize. Thanks, this is wonderful. Thank you. I am so intrigued by this idea of Sojourner Truth as a self-published author in among other self-published authors, that there was a kind of community of them. Um, because we think of self-published authors now as very atomized, as outside of the community of publication. Mm -hmm. And it's, in a sense, they were rivals. I don't know if people said, oh, I have to get yet another slave narrative, or if people... Well, they did. I mean, yeah. this was in the anti-slavery community. Yeah. So they did, yeah. And did they interact? Did they know each other? Did they talk about publishing? Any well, thoughts on that? Well, I know that Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth knew each other. Uh, Frederick Douglass never puffed or even noticed Sojourner Truth, you know, sexist, racist times. Um, he was too important. Um, but they must have run into, you know, to each other because they were moving in the same, dare I say, market. Uh, thank you for a riveting narrative. I really appreciate the attention to materiality and specificity and sort of the truth of truth, I suppose. Um, we were just bicycle riding on the Mid-Hudson um, Trail, and on our way back from the west side to the east side, mm -hmm. noticed this incredible um, statue of, of Sojourner Truth, and that's where we learned, oh, she's a New Yorker. Um, <laughs> And just wondering, did you have any input into that? Were you consulted? No, um, no, I didn't have any in input into the Elster County commemorations. But uh, so you saw over the walkway of the Hudson? Yeah, yeah beautiful. Uh, that is only a couple of years old, if that. There's also um, uh, one I like very much of a child, the Sojourner Truth Isabella is a, ch as a working child at Port Ewan which is probably about seven years old now. But I will tell you a story. I'm gonna to take too much of your time, but I, I, you led me into commemoration, uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, the sculptor um, who made the childhood, uh, Isabella, um, Offered, she's well known for a sculptor. What's her name? Littlecombe. Um, but she's a, you know, she's a representational. She makes big sculptures to commemorate people. So um, SUNY New Paltz long ago named its library for Sojourner Truth. And in fact, I have uh, one of my honorary degrees is from SUNY New Paltz. And you know, it was, it was while I was writing on Sojourner, you know, so that. So. Um, SUNY New Pulse has been attached to Sojourner Truth for quite a while, like now, probably a quarter century or more. And the sculpture said to them, um, I will make a Sojourner Truth and Isabella as she is leaving her enslavement with her child on her hip or her back or wherever she carried her child. Um, and I will only charge you the cost of the materials, and I will help you raise the money. And for those of you who are on the board, you know that that sounds like magic. I will help you raise the money. And uh, so Sunni Nupal said, yes, great. And they put it on their website, and they said, it's coming along, it's going to be great. And. Uh, in 2021, the website still said, it's coming along, it's going to be great, it's coming out, it's coming out in 2020, and in uh, 22, I look in 2020, it's still the same website. So I, you know, I got in touch with the sculptor, and I said, what's going on? And it turns out that the administrators, the administration had said, yes, yes, they had not said a single word to the faculty of color, 
to African American studies or anybody who wasn't just right there. African American studies at SUNY New Paltz has been shamefully neglected and they saw this as just another thing. And then the administration said, oh, we got a problem. And so recently, uh, last spring, I asked the sculptor, you know, where is it? It's in storage in Kingston. But I'm going to use that. My first chapter is called Sojourner Truth Monument because the first Sojourner Truth Monuments appeared after I published in 96. The first one is by Elizabeth Catlett in Sacramento, California in 1999. So we've had, you know, the, the one, the next one I think is the one in, in Northampton. And then there's a great big one in Battle Creek. You know, they're, they're popping up around. So Sojourner Truth has changed and commemoration has changed, but American issues persist. That sounds like the perfect note on which <laughs> all of us can thank Nell Irvin Painter for just a splendid Barron lecture. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. I will also put in a plug for watching this again and recommending it to your friends. It will be on our YouTube channel very soon, uh, as are all of our public programs. You can also look at our website, AmericanAntiquarian.org, for other upcoming programs. But for now, let's thank Nell Irvin Painter once more as we say good evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>